everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on yen, yet another episode of Unsuited. We're on our third episode today in season one. And like good corporate governance demands, we're going to focus on diversity today. So presenting our first lady guest. And wait, wait, wait. She's not just any lady. She's a lady who runs her practice with an iron fist. And her multitasking abilities are, well, what dreams are made of. She's built an empire and she's always, always accessible to her clients and her team, no matter the time of day or night. She has, well, pretty much, uh, how shall I say, well, the, the, the notion of the glass ceiling, she's completely shattered that and the shards have hurt quite a few uh, of her juniors, contemporaries and seniors, right, with the expertise she's brought onto the table. So without further ado, presenting... Zia Modi. She's a mother, wife, daughter, sister, and a grandmother. But one look at her and you know that she's a force to reckon with. Hi, Zia. Good evening. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. Good evening, Tanisha. Hi, Zia. Hi, Vikas. So uh, I'll kick off first and then uh, Tanisha will uh, we'll be doing a double act on you today. We were thinking beforehand it's going to take more than one of us to interview you. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to go back a few years, um, really starting with um, why did you choose to study law at Cambridge and then Harvard Law School? And then how did that experience impact you and your journey as a lawyer? So um, I left India to study law uh, simply because my mother did not want me to get married to my husband uh, at such a young age. And when I uh, told her after college that I would like to get married, I think in uh, three months she put me on a plane uh, to England uh, without uh, any admission and told me to go and find myself a seat in college and study law. And she would talk about it after that. And then I finished my law like a good girl. And uh, she decided that uh, it wasn't yet time for me to come back. So she told me that I should trot off to America to do an LLM. So that's how I landed up, actually. This is reverse of most stories of Indian, young Indian women. It's normally parents are forcing their young girls to get married, even today. And here it's like your mom saying, no way. Uh, don't repeat that mistake <laughs> so early. Well, well, you have to understand, Zia, you, you have to be honest and tell us at what age did you meet your now husband and then boyfriend? Because we know he was the neighborhood boy and we know you started dating fairly young. So how young were you both? That's why mama wanted to keep you apart, right? I was around 15, 16. That explains it. That's what my mother says. <laughs> But you still that, went ahead and married him uh, at some point. And there's a very interesting snippet around that that you said in one of your interviews where your dad said, come on, now let her get married. She's 28. Otherwise, he's going to run off and say no. And exactly. That, my, ma my father came to the rescue. You see, the, I'm a Baha'i by religion. And under our Baha'i law, we are not allowed to get married unless we have the consent of both the parents, of both the spouses, whatever their religion. So uh, everyone else said yes, but my mother who's a Baha'i said no. Wow. So I had to wait, we had to wait till she came around and decided I was genuinely going to be uh, just not marriageable. And then... <laughs> <laughs> so Zia, Zia have, you, have you told this story to Karan Johar? No. I think he would love it. <laughs> okay. So. And the, but how was the experience? Obviously, you, know, you got shipped off to England, then America to go and... And did she tell you to go and study law? Was that the thing? Or just do anything, just don't get married? I always wanted to study law. So that was not a, uh, not a requirement that came from her. Um, as I've said before, um, I never really thought of any other career. Uh, probably my father's influence... Uh, just uh, hearing him being slightly argumentative myself, 
so uh, it all added up. I don't think that was a very critical choice between law or something else. Okay, I like and, the, that you put in a slight, slightly <laughs> argumentative. <laughs> the interesting snippet though on the personal side is that since you chose to, to study and practice the law, I think your brother who really wanted to be a lawyer, uh, he, he didn't get a chance. Can you tell us a little bit about that? He's a doctor now as we understand it, right? So yes, that's absolutely right. My, uh, my, I'm the eldest. So my uh, sibling after me, my brother, uh, also wanted to be very much a lawyer. And I suspect my father wanted him to be a lawyer as well. But uh, my mother, if you call me a force of nature, you should see her. She basically said one lawyer, go be a, go be a doctor. So that's what happened. Wow. Okay. Wow. Uh, and how, so how was that experience? A lawyer in the family. So, so in that sense, you guys are, are pretty safe. Absolutely covered, especially right now. Correct. <laughs> Very relevant. Um, and Zia, how was that experience um, of studying overseas you know, as a young Indian woman as well? And what impact did that have on your journey? So uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, what I really learned was that, uh, you know, in India, we're, we're very good at memorizing. Uh, a lot of our uh, memory is uh, useful. Uh, but what happened to me when I went to England, especially, is that you have the, uh, the uh, tutorial system. So you go for your lectures where everybody attends, two, three hundred lawyers. And then you really learn in small classes of seven or eight or ten and that's where the tutor comes in and actually exacts and extracts the best out of you. And he doesn't want you to give back what you've read up or mugged up. Uh, he is asking you trick questions. Uh, he's challenging uh, your answers. Even if they are the right answers, he's putting across a different point of view and asking you to respond. So you very quickly learn uh, what I call the bottom line approach. What's the bottom line in this issue and what's the problem? And the researching also, uh, what I felt I learned was to deep dive into the relevant aspect of the problem. So if you had a particular issue, you looked for the nuancing within that issue. And that's when you started learning how to identify the key three or four trouble areas or the positive areas and so your ability to talk back, not in a negative way, but to, to, to debate, uh, to have an honest conversation. And more importantly, uh, a lot of times you are just wrong. Uh, and so how to figure out how to deal with the incorrectness of your thought process and how to bring it back into the logic that law demands. So law is logic at the end of the day. I always tell the juniors that if something is not sounding logical to you in your research, it's probably wrong. You've got it wrong. Go back and check again. So that's what I learned really. Uh, analytical skills and uh, the fierce requirement of logic. Fantastic. And that is, um, I know even looking at the Indian education system today as well, that argument still kind of prevails that uh, we're much more rote learning and high, we have a high high knowledge bank, but that whole ability to process and argue logically and rationally um, still is kind of, you know, not quite there in the Indian education system. It's getting there. I'm sure it's there in, in several schools. Hmm. Uh, it's not that you don't have to learn and you don't have to memorize. Of course you do. It's how you take that and then apply it to each fact pattern. Yeah. Okay, super. And then obviously from, from there you went to, you know, you went to Baker's, you did about five years and, you know, in the US as a lawyer. Um, and then you, you covered M&A, PE, corporate law, moving into litigation, to Indian courtrooms, you know, and very, very much built a reputation of being, you know, the queen of negotiation for corporate India. Just tell us a bit about how you managed to switch so seamlessly between different practice areas, you know, and also which, which one you actually enjoy the most. So uh, after being a corporate associate in New York, when I came back, there wasn't much choice. 
because don't forget, I came back in the early 80s, 83, 84. And at that time, uh, there was no foreign direct investment. Uh, we opened up in 1991, if you recall. And uh, all I had when I came back was the courts. Uh, and so I uh, started uh, uh, appearing as junior counsel, uh, put my band and gown on every day. Uh, when I did not have work uh, in the beginning, which was quite often, uh, my father would uh, counsel me to go and sit in the courts of the various judges and to uh, study uh, the court. Uh, is he a landlord's judge? Is he a tenant judge? Is he a pro-labor judge? Is he a pro-employer judge? So, you know, know thy judge uh, was pretty much the counsel that he gave me. And so in the early years, as a young junior, you took whatever you got. And my father's uh, present to me when I joined the bar was about uh, uh, 32 or 35 copies of what we call the Bear Act, which is just the act, no commentary. And he said, this is the best thing that you can learn because don't forget, when I came back, uh, I had never studied Indian law in my life. And so uh, whilst, of course, it was Commonwealth jurisprudence, the statute is the statute. And therefore the counsel that I got was read each statute cover to cover like a story, like a bear act. Don't get fuddled by the commentary. And once you've grasped what the act is trying to do and where it's trying to go, then start applying it to your matter and then read up the commentary. So that's how I started as a junior barrister. And then, uh, of course, life became busier. I did that for about uh, 10 years plus uh, before I then morphed back into corporate practice. Um, and if you ask me how I did it so seamlessly, it was not at all seamless. Uh, because uh, after 10 years, I was wearing the hat of a barrister uh, who is the elite of our crop and our profession. And uh, my father was very depressed that I had morphed back into table practice. Uh, I was uh, wondering if I had made the right decision because I enjoyed the bar and appearing and arguing and getting more uh, single briefs, as they call it. Uh, but I think that the overwhelming rush of clients and queries that came to me uh, after India opened up uh, was such that I didn't want to leave that behind. I didn't want to give that up. And I tried very hard for maybe two years to straddle both, but it was absolutely impossible. I could not... Uh, could not let my guard down for a second in court because I would be one of the few women with a hundred men in the courtroom and it didn't work that I would make mistakes. And of course, your clients from overseas are not going to keep waiting for you to finish court, finish your conferences and then get round to their queries. So I slowly disengaged from appearing in court, sadly. And mm -hmm. then... Uh, uh, we started uh, uh, Chambers of Zia Modi. Did you, did you feel that pressure, like you mentioned, that being one of the very few women in court in a male-dominated structure, did you feel that pressure of having to be better than them? and uh, being Not better, uh, but certainly I didn't want to be uh, tripped up. Uh, and uh, because there were so few women that would actually be arguing, or effectively assisting. Uh, the pressure obviously was on, not only, not necessarily from my peers, my juniors, my fellow juniors, but more from the clients and therefore the solicitors who would send me briefs. So the client would always have, I think, maybe a slight question mark as to, I was much thinner and more petite. And uh, the, uh, the client, I'm sure, had a question mark. Is is this girl going to manage? And why is he giving it to this uh, young girl? And therefore, in order to justify the faith that my solicitor had reposed in me by batting for me, 
uh, I used to work overtime to make sure that uh, even if we lost, it was not because we hadn't done, I had not done anything. That's actually yeah, very interesting and insightful, Zia which is actually taking us to our next question. Uh, I know that a lot has been said about how you treat your clients. Uh, your clients have said it, your partners have said it, your juniors have said it. Pretty much anyone who's had the advantage and privilege of working with Zia Modi knows how Zia Modi treats her clients. That said... How uh, does she? Beautifully. <laughs> you're, you're, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that your bank balance is reflecting how well you treat them. So... <laughs> You don't want to hear it from us. <laughs> so, jokes aside, uh, you know, while the client is so important in, in uh, you know, the kind of work all of us do, right, the practice of law, there is something very peculiar about you right from your early days, which is that you always offer the client the right opinion. And you're not so fussed about whether it pleases them or not. Their reaction is, is always unimportant. You want to do the right thing by them. And I'm sure that this is never easy to pull off, at least not when you're just starting off your journey like you were sharing in the previous uh, couple of minutes. So how, when did you first find the courage to do this? And where did you learn this to begin with? So frankly, it was not such a great revelation or an effort because don't forget, as a counsel uh, arguing in court, uh, again, what my father always told me is that you are first an officer of the court and everything else follows. So you, I never grew up with the uh, mindset that you could argue anything to please a client and get a victory. Uh, what mattered was the credibility of your case before the judge, which is facts, facts, facts and law. And the facts could never be twisted. They could be nuanced, could never be twisted. And uh, what mattered again was the personal credibility that you had to develop with the members of the bench and your fellow members at the bar. So it came very naturally in the sense that, you know, I didn't have to be some virtuous uh, female to have this quality uh, beaten into me. It was just practical. Uh, again, as my father used to tell me, uh, you say one thing wrong before one judge, it doesn't stay with that judge. They all talk at the lunch table. Right? So uh, the way I was uh, trained was as a counsel to present the facts, uh, to keep the uh, uh, hat of the officer of the court above all else. And frankly, uh, you know, most times that was absolutely good enough. Uh, if the client had a bad case, uh, the expectation management had to be done before you went into court. You couldn't finish telling him you have a thousand percent victory when he had a bad set of facts. Uh, and I was guided by a great senior. I had a senior called Obed Chinoy, who was my father's junior. And uh, his daughter was later my junior. Uh, but uh, <coughs> that was his DNA as well. Even in the drafting, when you draft and when the judges are reading what you've drafted, because your name is there, right? Drafted by Zia Modi or settled by Zia Modi. Uh, how you present it is always critical. Uh, you can de-emphasize stuff, you can highlight stuff, but you can never keep back stuff. Sure. And uh, so, so when you say, how did that translate into MNA? It was a natural. Uh, you would tell your clients, uh, the reality check. Uh, I'm not stupid as to, you know, go into the first meeting and tell the client, you might as well commit suicide. But the way you present the facts, the way you draw it out of the client, the way you uh, put the weaknesses, the strengths all in one bucket, in one hotspot for the client to look at the whole picture. That is the key. So he understands what is black and what is white. Very little is black and white. And then there are all these shades of gray. And then you basically, partly it's instinct. You know, what do you feel? What is your gut? That instinct grows better with experience. But even then, uh, you can sense something that is looking malignant. You can 
then something that is looking benign and you know the various shades in between and i think that early on uh, when i was younger uh maybe life was such at that time that clients didn't like you saying that oh you can't do this or this doesn't work uh and maybe there was more of a can do ecosystem uh life has completely changed now i think what the client values today is if you tell them the level of risk uh and each client has a different risk appetite but he wants to know what you think or she wants to know what you think of the level of risk so that's how uh clients now appreciate uh because you're trying to lay the path forward to say okay you want to do this today but that's fine but these are the possible ramifications uh it looks likely unlikely highly likely and now you take your call so i think that's how i that's how i've done it all these years zia it sounds like um what you once said in an interview with et now that lawyering is very much similar to psychological counseling so the kind of what you're saying now about the advice you're giving it sounds very similar, similar to being a counselor to your client that's when the clients don't want to hear the truth then you go into a counselor mode <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is because you know everybody's human especially your client and he deserves all your care affection and uh, attention and if you don't put on the hat that he has of his worries of his requirements of his wanting to do a deal really badly of him being in a competitive process where he wants you to put him in a position that is better if you don't understand that and you give out dry theoretical advice how does it work uh, today i am essentially a transactional lawyer 80% of the time and so what should be my goal to get a deal done in the right possible way and uh, it's not my business to say you should give up this or give up that i can guide him and i can tell her that uh, you know normally we don't do this or i think you can push back and get away with it but ultimately commercial decisions and the check is theirs and so they expect me to understand what is passing through their mind uh why they want a certain thing so badly or why they want to avoid a certain thing so badly so that's the counseling part i think yeah i think um that's great advice even even in today's era where um the gc especially in india is more empowered than ever before and we're constantly hearing this debate about um lawyers need to come across as advisors to business and understand the client's business more than ever and i think you know what you were doing 20 plus years ago or even 25 plus years ago is really relevant even today so i think that's great advice for even younger lawyers and younger partners um you know who are kind of struggling with this power shift to clients becoming much more heavy they much more kind of um sophisticated especially in india so i'm going to pick up from what zia said and you know zia you said that everyone is human right uh, and to err is human so of course failure is very much part of being human in lieu of that you've said in one of your interviews that to you failure means not being trusted will you help us understand why that is such a critical value that you hold so close to your heart i guess because if your client doesn't trust you why will he listen to you right at at my level he's not coming to me for drafting the severability clause right he's coming to me because he wants my gut uh which is going to shape the way his particular transaction or his regulatory issues go forward if he doesn't trust your judgment why will he come to you can talk to his wife or she can talk to her husband he's coming to me because there is value in what i am telling him which takes into account not just the law but law plus 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 have there and have there been moments where you felt like you've not been trusted and that's not felt very good i think maybe a couple of times uh i may have pushed too hard and the client may have felt that you know 
Why is she doing this? Um, but I don't think I've been in a position where I feel my own client doesn't trust me. You, I think when you say push too hard, you're also the kind of lawyer who's just so passionate, right? About uh, not just about her own work, like not just the law, but also the business of your client. That when you say push too hard, I can very well imagine you saying, no, don't do this because it's not good for you, right? I can fully imagine you being that person sometimes. Is that you sometimes? And also very often, I think, you know, the mature clients understand that part of a good lawyer's job in a transaction uh, is also to see what the other side can give and cannot give, right? So you have to wear the other side's hat internally when you're discussing with the client to say, can he really be pushed on this? Or can we trade this? Or can we keep this last? Or what is really a deal breaker for us? What would really be a deal breaker for him? And therefore, when you play that dual role, uh, within an internal conference with the client, then, you know, it all flushes out as to what, what will it take to get the deal done. Sure. Excellent. Um, on that point, uh, side point, uh, one of your mature ex-clients, Prasanna, says hi. He was typing away. Well, he's a, he's a great man and he was very kind to give me a lot of briefs as a junior and he encouraged me to argue, so I will never forget press. Um, and you were talking about the kind of values and skills you brought to the table with your clients, which is why it's a high level of trust. Um, and you're known as a scrupulous fact checker and a truth hound. So are, are these natural talents that you had? Or are they, are they kind of skills that can be honed and developed? Which skills? Sorry, because I couldn't hear you. It was a, a scrupulous fact checker. So that your sense of fact always checker. finding facts. Yeah. Fact, so, F-A-C-T. Fact. fact checker. Ah. And, and, and a truth, truth hound. hound. Truth and a truth hound. hound. True? Truth. Truth hound, Zia. Truth. truth hound. Truth hound. Okay. No, I think that what I developed as a junior counsel, which I think I took to my m and uh, table, was that uh, if you don't have the facts, uh, you will 100% be wrong when you argue. And if you don't have what uh, a lot of the lawyers at AZB laugh about, uh, a perfect list of dates, then you will definitely go wrong. So what I learned as a counsel is wrong list of dates, loss. Right list of dates, good chance, right? So that's the truth, right? The fact checker, the data, the data, the data. Then you combine that with what is the law. Now, Today, for a lot of that, I depend on being briefed properly. But even today, in about 50 to 60% of my briefings, I will look at the source. I will say, show me the section, show me the judgment, show me the paragraph, show me the regulation. Because I still have uh, an insane requirement uh, to be ready uh, in my own head before I go in and either talk to my own client or the other side or a regulator because you can't be caught napping on domain. You can only be a good senior m &A lawyer if you have domain. You cannot turn around in the middle of a session which is a negotiation and ask the lawyer next to you, what is that section? Then that is the section which is key to the negotiation, right? Mm. So, Fortunately, uh, I would say 99% of the time, everybody knows how I like to be briefed. Uh, some lawyers do it better than others. It's a shorter briefing because they know what the heart of the issue is. Some, takes, uh, some lawyers take a bit longer. And if I don't know something, I think the best thing that I have learned, again, uh, from my days as a junior counsel, is to say, I don't know this. I need to check it rather than trying to just bullshit my way through the discussion and get it wrong. Mm. So even in court, if there was a judgment which I had looked up, which was awful if I was in that position, but if there was a judgment sprung on me or the judge asked me a question I was not ready to answer and I wanted to be more thoughtful about it, I would tell the judge, I need some time. 
and I think that <clears throat> that honesty uh, of not having to uh, pretend that you know everything all the time is very important for young lawyers and older lawyers because uh, I remember there was a uh, uh, young man called Javed Khan who used to head up Blackstone in India and Blackstone at that time was you know the client to get and still is and uh, basically he came and he was interviewing all the law firms and uh, then he came back and he said, uh, we'd like you to work for us. So I said, great. And then he said, uh, do you know why uh, I uh, chose uh, your firm? I said, no. He said, because I asked you several questions and you said, I don't know to two of them. And that was important for me. So I didn't even realize that. That came so naturally. So I think that an acknowledgement of the fact that we don't have to know everything all the time uh, but we must know most of the things most of the time uh, and the domain with which the opposite side respects you is critical. So if I start on a legal argument and I wash away into a nothingness and the guy opposite me says, oh, she's just, you know, bullshitting her way out of this. That doesn't work. That is not what I'm paid for. That is not what the client will expect. And so I try to combine uh, not too much detail with enough detail and constantly worry about the fact that my domain should be up to date. You know, I'm going to say something here. The Grey Matter team, so Neha, Shreya and I have all worked with Zia at some point or the other. And I'd like to share this that no matter what time of day you were meeting her, no matter how much content you were going to her with, whether it was many large files or just one single sheet of paper, that one error on that sheet is what Zia would miraculously pick up. <laughs> so you're standing there literally biting your nails going, oh God, please, oh God, please let this be error free because you have checked the document about 10 times, right? You, you're now looking, the documents become a blur to you. And there you go. In the first five minutes, Zia has miraculously picked up that error and said, why have you come to me without checking this? And you're like, I'm sorry, <laughs> I tried. So, you know, I learned, I don't know if I learned, but I observed that skill set from Gulam Manwati, with whom I used to, uh, for whom I used to be a junior in a few matters. That man had the ability to speed read in a way I've never seen anybody else before. And while he was busy speed reading, he would catch the smallest of smallest of errors. And Gulam never shouted. Uh, he would get quieter and quieter the more he got, you know, cheesed off. And so the lower the voice, the more you felt, oh God, what have I done? But he would pick up right from conceptual issues to uh, how you phrased an argument, uh, to the use of your language, uh, to provide a better adjective if you needed to in your court pleadings. And so I always marveled at the fact that he could look at the macro and the micro. I'm sometimes accused of being too micro, uh, which is probably correct. But I think the, the ideal combination is a bit of both, right? Maybe more macro than less micro. Super. Again, I think again, um, Zia, super advice for the younger ones listening as well, because you don't often hear um, lawyers, you know, ha having the confidence to say, I don't know. Right? And especially, you know, uh, within the legal community here as well. So, you know, it's not often you get many partners, managing partners, having the confidence, you know, and that culture of being able to admit, I don't know this, we need to come back to you. And I think that's great advice, again, to you know, lawyers think, out there. Uh, because most managing partners would behave the same way. Because they know there is no brownie point in saying something incorrect, right? It sticks with the client that the managing partner got it wrong. So I don't think it's there. I think uh, probably what the young lawyers need to do a bit more of if they need uh, counsel from a 63-year-old is that <laughs> a lot of them try to get their answers from their QB neighbors. What's the story here? What's the situation here? Oh, what did you do in that matter? I think the imperative 
as far as I'm concerned, is to validate what your thought is by going to the root of the matter. If you're asking somebody to talk to you about, you know, section 27 or section 28 of the contract, first of all, have you read it? Have you read the explanation to it? Have you read the commentary behind it? Have you looked at some key cases on those sections? And then you have that discussion. Because if you have it without your own research, you are bound to accept what the other guy says because you don't know better. When you do that, it's just piggybacking of someone else. When you study it for yourself and talk to someone, it's a healthy debate. I think that's the difference. Excellent. Um, and what, what's really obvious and I think well known about you is that you, know, you demand excellence. You know, and that's obviously you've had great mentors to help shape that. And you've got a reputation, as Finish was saying, of a taskmaster as well. Um, but do you, do you feel that kind of pressure then that may, you know, may then transfer to your team? Um, is it possible for others to really give their best when they're constantly knowing they're going to get caught out somehow? And, you know, we're, we're having to go to Zia, who is going to pick up a floor somewhere. You should ask them. <laughs> I think my expectations are clear. Yeah. I require a briefing after thoughtfulness. Right. I don't like stupid mistakes coming to my desk because they've not been thought through. I appreciate a different point of view, which I'm happy to debate with and even happier if I'm wrong. But uh, what I don't like is sloppy preparation. And so, Maybe that's where I get upset. <laughs> does, does your voice go higher or lower? Higher. <laughs> no, no, not true. Not always. Sometimes she's just sitting there and staring at the sheet and you're like, react, react, do something. So I know <laughs> if this is going okay for me or not. <laughs> and, and when she looks up at you and smiles, you feel like you have won the world over that day. <laughs> Thank you, Tanisha. I thought you were going to leave this audience with the impression that I just never appreciated anybody and bashed up everyone. You, you know, <laughs> I'm telling you, seeking your approval meant so much to all of us. I'm telling you, it, it made us hungry for validation. And, and very rightly so, because I'm telling you, we always went back to our desks, and this is private conversation that you're now privy to, Zia. We went back and said, how does she do it? She always picks up on the right stuff. Why are we so foolish? You know? <laughs> so well, I'm 63. <laughs> <laughs> so we have so to wait, Tanisha. We have to wait a couple of years. You, you a lot more years, me a couple. Correct. You Correct. tend to sift through. You tend to sift through a lot of stuff as you get older, simply because you just had the experience of dealing with so much more that, as I said, it's the original training. What is the bottom line? True, true. And also, I think your ability to just, uh, you know, to always know, I, I think it's got something to do with reading our faces also at some level. You just know that, you know, they've walked in here not doing enough, uh, you know, background work. And, and so you'd kind of pick up on the vibe. I think Zia is also a very intuitive leader. Tell us if I'm wrong, Zia. Most senior leaders are intuitive, isn't it? You can't not have a leader being intuitive. I think, I, think, uh, yeah, I, think, sorry, I think a lot of Tanisha's guilty conscience is coming out now. <laughs> she did fine. She did well. She doesn't do it. See, I'll be like, please refund that money I paid you. All those salary checks, bring them back home. <laughs> never. <laughs> so kind. Thank you. But jokes aside, then, there was never a time we walked out of a room without learning a thing or two, either about the issue at hand or about ourselves. So for that, I think we'll, we'll be eternally grateful, Zia. This is on YouTube, right? Everybody can hear this, right? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, I put it as part of the induction process. Now. Please do. It's not part of your HR manual. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Um, and the next question, um, given, given kind of your knowledge, your reputation, and how much you have to give to corporate India, um, you sit on very few boards. As a non-exec director, you only sit on a few boards across the country. So um, why have you chosen 
uh, to be so restricted in that and not be on more boards as a non-executive director? So I don't sit on any boards in India. I sit on uh, two or three boards abroad. But uh, from the very beginning, uh, again, my father's advice, uh, never to be put in a position of uh, whatever sort of, again, not being able to speak out in the sense that, you know, you don't want to be confrontational uh, on a board that values you. Uh, I always felt that I was much better ser serving the client by sitting outside the board itself and by guiding them with honest advice, which sometimes the board may not find palatable. And uh, to then sit there and advocate a position uh, which uh, the board may ultimately disagree with just meant that you are putting yourself in a situation of unnecessary confrontation. One. Next is that, I mean, as we see today, what's the charm in being on a board necessarily, right? Uh, it's uh, so much liability. There's so much gateway responsibility that the regulator puts on you. It's difficult uh, to keep track of what is going on. And if you are, God forbid, caught, you know, with the flashlight in your eyes, as a professional, who needs the mental trauma of trying to save yourself from all these liabilities and inquiries? Uh, and, and, and for what? Uh, you never get more work, is my belief, by being a director. You may get less work if the board is cheesed off with what you're saying. Uh, and if you want to please the board, and that is at the cost of your honest advice, then that's no good as being a director. Mm. So we have always felt as a firm that we should avoid directorships as far as possible. And uh, I am personally not a director on any listed company or a client's unlisted company. Great. Uh, Prasanna has thrown in a question for you. For um, What advice would you give to young aspiring general counsel? So I think the role of the general counsel has also morphed for the better. Uh, Prasanna was one of the general counsel, even in his times, which where he crafted the role very, very responsibly and took a lot of accountability of uh, the outcomes of the advice on himself. Um, otherwise, a lot of general counsel were seen wrongly, I think, as just being an intermediary between the company and the lawyers. The role of the general counsel has become much more responsible, much more meaningful, uh, much more onerous uh, with all the responsibility, especially if you are in a listed company as general counsel. Uh, you take the case of uh, Shubha, Shubha Mandal, who was with us, as you know. Uh, he has, uh, you know, one of the most interesting and challenging jobs of corporate India as GC of Tata Sons, right? But with that comes again, uh, what are the same requirements? Domain, time, psychological counseling, firefighting, intermediation, collaboration, the trust of the other side. All these qualities are now required in a general counsel more so as they grow older. And the younger GCs, basically, I would say, have to develop in themselves enough confidence to be able to not keep running to outside lawyers all the time. That, counts, that confidence comes with what? Domain, right? So a general counsel, to my mind, has to spend as much time reading, knowing, staying up to date, having his own knowledge management as any outside lawyer. And I think the general counsel, if you ask me, has the benefit of looking much more into the business than an outside lawyer would have. And that again is very critical to know the business much more and intimately is to be able to advise better on the risk taking and the 360 degrees. So if somebody comes to me with an issue I can deep dive into that issue. I can, from a common sense point of view, say, how will it impact this? How will it impact that? 
but the general council will actually know how it will impact many other things other companies the same issue coming up in other listed companies in the group the same issue having been dealt with in a particular way the same issue where one of the group companies got screwed in a particular way all that business data and business uh, management uh, is something that is special to the general counsel and, and his or her team I think great advice again for young lawyers because uh, young GCs especially. We're, we're going to move on to more of a personal one in terms of um, you grew up with um, three boys and then as a mother you raised three, three young girls. Um, how did you manage that balance between being you know, a daughter, then a mother, setting up your own firm? Um, how did you get the, the kind of work-life balance and be able to manage all of that? So now you're asking me to go publicly on what I've said in many interviews. I have had no work life balance. And, uh, you know, that has always been my regret. Uh, in the beginning, um, I got married in 84. I had my kids in 86, 87 and 1990. So quick succession. Fortunately, at that time, I was at the bar. And so being a junior barrister or just being a, a counsel, uh, you have the luxury of just saying, I don't want to do the matter. You can't do that in an m &A, uh, context in a law firm. So uh, at the time when I had the kids and, you know, for the time that I was at home with the kids, uh, it wasn't uh, difficult to take a break at that time. But those were not long breaks. And so, as I've also said very often, uh, I lived with my mother-in-law, who was the bedrock uh, of the home. And the reason, frankly, that I could continue to be a hardworking lawyer. Uh, and then uh, kids grew up. I don't ask them what they missed. Uh, I don't uh, ask them how much they resented me. I can only hope that now, when they are in their 30s and have kids of their own, they can understand maybe and be a little proud. But uh, of course, it's a journey of constant guilt with a capital G. Mm. It's uh, the quota of guilt that varies from decade to decade. Uh, but it's, it's always been a struggle. And I think for most women, they will resonate with this. It is a struggle. And uh, how you manage your support system how you manage the ecosystem at your work. Um, most importantly, how you uh, have a hopefully happy life in your marriage, which mm. goes up and down when stresses come in. And, you know, time is the enemy. Time is the enemy. So for a woman, that's the key sacrifice. Mm. Have you, have you managed to transition to um, the other capital G grandmother? Yes. Uh, again, I don't ask my daughter what she thinks of me as a grandmother because I know her, her uh, marks will go to the grandfather. Uh, <laughs> but yes, I mean, who wouldn't? It's, it's delightful. It's another world. Okay, super. Thank you, thank you, Zia. We're going to transition to uh, Manisha doing uh, more, I don't, know, don't want to say fun, but the demonstration round and the interrogation, which is Manisha's speciality. <laughs> thank you.